Yeah, no, she'll definitely be good. Um, and then, yeah. Maybe a four person, so those are the three that were awesome. We're taking that class. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Whenever TA walks in, every single time, she's just like, because what's also not good about her as a big guy is that she has like certain expectations that then she just changes on and on throughout the class. Like she'll have her TA come in, grab something that's not part of lecture at all, just to show her students something. But, but, why do that? Good morning. Um, when I walked into class this morning, it was so hot. That's why both of the doors were open. I'm so glad I came early. The heater was going in here, and it was going crazy. Super hot. It's all good. Um, I opened both doors and came place to the here. I don't, I don't like being cold, but I definitely don't like being hot. I like things to be perfect for me. Uh, so if you're uncomfortable, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm slightly more important than you are. <laughs> okay. We completed reaction one. We completed reaction one. The last things we talked about, and we'll go over those again, because we kind of tried to hurry to cram this in our lecture. Uh, the last things we talked about, uh, the main things we talked about is this is a regulatory step, right? And I told you that's important because um, uh, there aren't many. Out of our 10 steps of glycolysis, only three steps function as regulation steps. We have three irreversible steps. Three steps, somewhere in this step, there's an irreversible reaction. Three steps um, in glycolysis are irreversible. Uh, these three steps are regulation steps. Step one is one of those regulation steps. It's a minor regulation step. Um, it's not a major on-off switch. Uh, but it is a regulation step, specifically product inhibition of heterokinase and the vast difference in KM between glucokinase and heterokinase are functioned as a way to throttle uh, uh, glycolysis, slow down, speed up glycolysis, and also uh, specifically the hexokinase kind of turn off glycolysis in certain areas. Genesis, production of glycolysis. Out of the cell. If you want to read more about this um, chapter, it, it's talked about. So, so these regulation steps that we that we're going to talk about, and, and again, uh, so somebody was asking us today, what kind of detail do you want um, about various regulation steps that we're going to be talking about? <sighs> regulation, metabolism, and regulation is an entire course. It's an entire one semester course. We're going to talk about metabolic pathways and the regulation of metabolic pathways. We could literally spend an entire semester talking about regulation of metabolic pathways. There is a class here. Talk about your hero or Mandal. Um, I, think, I don't know if I know Mandal teaches it. Uh, Sun Dio teaches it. I know, no, maybe Dio teaches it in the book. Did they take it? No, we have to take it. It's out. Does anybody got the PhD? Oh, no, you have a PhD. Yeah, so if, if this interests you, if regulation interests you, there's a class, an extra course you can take just on regulation. Oh, what kind of detail do, do I want you to know? Um, I want you to understand where these regulation steps occur and a brief one sentence overview of, of, of what are the important factors of these regulation steps, specifically product inhibition by heterokinase. Vast difference in K KM, high KM, and Those are the types of things I want to do. If you want to know more, uh, you can look at the regulation chapter. I don't think uh, so. The chapter on glycolysis in the biochem textbook goes into more detail about the regulation steps than, than, than the Leninger textbook. The Leninger textbook does not really talk about regulation steps at all, but the Leninger textbook has a regulation chapter. Um, a, 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 a metabolism regulation chapter, so you can actually go to, to the next chapter and look at um, various uh, 
in the metabolism or regulation chapter, there'll be a section on glycolysis, so you can go to that chapter and look up and oh, it talks about all of these things in even a little more detail, not a lot, a little more detail than it's talked about in the biochemical. Um, folks just on like, metabolic regulation, if you think this is something that you're passionate about, you can look elsewhere. That's what I want to say. Where do these steps occur in a brief one sentence explanation of, of how this occurs? Oh, the last thing we talked about, um, this step is magnesium sensitive, right? This step is magnesium sensitive. Why is it magnesium sensitive? Uh, it's magnesium sensitive because our enzyme actually is specific for the magnesium complex of ATP, not specifically ATP, the magnesium complex of ATP. Um, what role does magnesium play? Magnesium shields um, ATP from um, this fast negative charge. The negative charge is actually shielding and buffering um, that partially positive phosphorus, right? So if we're drawing electron density um, back away from that phosphorus, or making it a better electrophile um, for easier attack, right? Um, the magnesium plays another one. I ask you to, to, to know it. What what if we're talking about just hydrolysis of ATP? Forget this. Hydrolysis of ATP. Um, does magnesium, the presence of magnesium, increase or decrease the hydrolysis of ATP? The rate of hydrolysis of ATP? Decrease. decrease, right? So that doesn't make a lot of sense here, right? Why does it decrease the, the rate of hydrolysis of ATP? What? What? So shielding oxygen, if 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 we were if we're let's go back. Yeah, so that's a good question, isn't it? It's a good question. Because what I just said here is completely counterintuitive to what I said before, wasn't it? Uh, it, it what? Or actually I didn't say it, I asked you to look. Um, and if you look at the hydrolysis of ATP, um, somewhere, right here. If we look at the hydrolysis of ATP, um, Magnesium, what role does magnesium play? Magnesium stabilizes ATP, right? And it slows down the rate of hydrolysis of ATP un, what? Un what? And catalyze, this is not a catalyzed reaction, right? So this is a non-catalyzed reaction. It slows down the rate of ATP. Why? Because magnesium stabilizes this tetrahedral complex. That's where it has to go to. It's a complex that's not tetrahedral. So magnesium inhibits the formation of this transition state. Guess what an enzyme does? It favors the formation of a transition state, right? It favors the formation of a transition state. So yes, magnesium plays a positive role, it plays a negative role. That negative role is overcome by the enzyme. That's the point of the enzyme, right? That is the purpose of the enzyme. So yes, magnesium has some positive characteristics that favor hydrolysis. It has some major negative characteristics that don't favor hydrolysis. The enzyme's role is to overcome those major negative characteristics, right? Does that make sense? I, I'm surprised nobody said this last time. Um, because that, it's a big it's a big point, right? If we already said magnesium lowers the rate of hydrolysis of ATP, but here we just said, oh, well, it's favorite. There's a reason. Oh, the last thing we talked about, induced fit. I don't like that. I don't like that your textbook has a, has a big, long uh, subsection um, on the induced fit of this. Why? Because it, it, it speaks of it as um, only specific enzymes follow this uh, pathway of binding and form, and that's what enzymes do, right? It's a, it's a cooperative process between substrate uh, and, and enzyme or substrate and protein. Uh, conformational changes do occur. Uh, to what degree depends on the enzyme and the protein you're talking about. And yes, there is a large conformational change, um, but the way they kind of talk about it seems like, oh, this is, a, this is rare. But that's what they do, right? And that's what they do. However, this has a large conformational change. The role of that conformational change we talked about at the very end, do you remember what it was? Why? Why such a major conformational change when binding ATP? Oh, from what? From what? From water, right? We want to hydrolyze ATP, right? We want to. We want phosphoryl transfer. If, if ATP is hydrolyzed in water, does that lead to phosphoryl transfer? No, it leads to production of an organic phosphate. And is that helpful? No. It's not. So this large conformational change facilitates hydrolysis of ATP by glucose, not by water, right? Takes it from water, this is happening in the cytosol, there is water available, a lot of it, a lot of it. So it's protecting uh, ATP from water, facilitating or hydrolysis of that ATP directly by glucose, not by adjacent.
Okay, we're caught up. Step two. So we have glucose 6 phosphate, right? Glucose to glucose 6 phosphate is step one. Step two, we are converting glucose to fructose. And, and bear with me. Right now, we're converting glucose to fructose. If your question is why, um, it's a valid question. We want to convert glucose to fructose. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, glucose to fructose. Converting glucose to fructose. Yes, it's glucose 6 phosphate to fructose 6 phosphate. Um, um, but the main idea is glucose to fructose, right? Uh, what is glucose? What is fructose? What's the difference? They're both hexoses, right? They're both 6. Hexose tells me that's a 6 carbon sugar. They're both 6 carbon sugar. One's an aldehyde, one's a ketone. What's the difference? Terminal what? Terminal hydrogen. Terminal carbonyl. Right. Terminal carbonyl. Terminal carbonyl. Um, we're probably gonna have terminal hydrogen regardless. Terminal carbonyl versus non-terminal carbonyl, right? Um, so terminal carbonyl, we have an aldehyde, an aldose. It's not terminal. We have ketose. Um, so in glucose, your carbonyl is carbon. Well, carbon number one, right? If it's terminal, it's carbon number one. Um, in fructose, it's not carbon number one, it's carbon number two, right? So we are moving our carbonyl from one to two. What type of reaction is that? <laughs> you did, didn't you? I know you did. We're moving something, right? It is an isomerization reaction through tautomerization. I like one. I like saying tautomerization. Fun word to say. Two. I like seeing tautomerization mechanisms. I like. It. Uh, I like seeing double bonds. I told this. I said this to a class yesterday. There are a lot of enzymatic reactions, um, um, organic reaction mechanisms that I don't like to look at. They're just un aesthetically unpleasing. Um, <clears throat> And that sounds really weird, doesn't it? Like I have a preference for the way a reaction mechanism works in front of my face. Um, I do, and uh, it doesn't get any better than this. I like being able to move around. I don't know why. It may be weird if you think it's weird, but uh, I don't care what you think. This is catalyzed by what type of enzyme? What class of enzyme would this be? Isomerase, right? And so a lot of the questions on your exam can be answered by by knowing those types of things, um, by knowing those, I, I told you before that you, I don't want you to spend time memorizing or studying the, the classic of enzymes. It's really not necessary. Uh, you should be able to identify those at this point anyway. Uh, here's kind of where that catches up. But on your exam, you maybe ask questions about specific steps. I told you the class was. Remember, um, it's a step about oxidation reduction. You better know which one of those enzymes. Dehydrogenase is the only enzyme in glycolysis that is involved with a redox reaction. That's it. So if you answer a kinase, I'm going to get mad. Because that's not what kinases do. You should know that. Oh, so this is catalyzed by phosphoglucose. Isomerase. And I, I, there, there are multiple isomerization reactions. There are three of them. Two of them are cat catalyzed by isomerases. So if you're given uh, this step and ask you what enzyme, uh, you better guess one of the three isomerase enzymes, right? Uh, guess one of the three isomerase enzymes. But, but you should be able to narrow, even if you don't know, know all of these by heart, uh, hopefully you do, but even if you don't know all of these by heart, you should be able to knock off two of the three, two or three of the five answer choices just by knowing the names of the class of Oh, so what does this do? We're taking glucose, we're going to fructose. So we are going from cyclic to what's it called? We are going to open it. At that point we will have an open chain. Aldose, right? So glucose is an aldose, an aldose. Mm -hmm. We are going to go from an open chain aldose to an open chain ketose. However, that double bond is going to have to move, right? It's going to have to move from one oxygen to a carbon-carbon bond onto the next carbon. 
So we need to get some sort of intermediate. This is an anodial intermediate. So it's in the cis conformation. We'll draw this intermediate here in just a second. And this will lead us to our next step, which is the open chain ketos, this oxygen, this oxygen oxygen here, right? So among other things, we're going from sugar and pyranose form. And sugar in what form? Both six member sugar. One of them is a six member green one. Five members. Six. Six member green one is a five member. Talk about why we care here for a second. So what does this look like? We start with our open chain albums. Open chain albums. Phosphate green. Phosphate. Set it and that's the one that it goes. Draw what's important. It's in the one. Two relevant active sites. Any, any about their active site residues? Cobalt of acid, decoordinated. Protonated basic amino acid. <laughs> and you may see different amino acids um, in different textbooks. Um, you may you may say uh, you know they may just give a general mechanism and not even put an amino um, um, label on amino acid and just say basic or basic. Why? Because things are going to change based on whatever species you're talking about, or whatever your well, what organism you describe. What organism you describe. This starts with a proton extraction of the glutamate residue. Step we see general acid catalysis. Glutamate, proton, one pair of histamine, and then hydrogen. Okay. 
And this structure can close. Structure when this open chain of ketones closes, it is going to close where um, an aldose closes at carbon number one. Ketose is going to close at what carbon? Carbonyl carbon, right? Anomeric carbon, just carbon, no longer carbon number one, right? Carbon number two. So it's going to close here, here, and you're going to be left with your product fructose 6 phosphate. And why? Why fructose? I still have not answered yet. Why fructose? Why fructose? Why fructose? Talk about our next step. Next step is false correlation. Again, another false correlation. Dance is killing me. My fructose, why don't we just phosphorylate glucose 6 phosphate? Let's go back again to our reaction mechanism of 40 days, I think. Nope, yep, 40 days. Reaction mechanism. Uh, uh, phosphoryl transfer. What does phosphoryl transfer look like? Pretend it's not water, right? Pretend it's glucose, so that hydrogen here is not ours, the remainder of glucose. What initiates this reaction? It's your first step. What's your first step of this reaction? A nucleophilic attack by what? An oxygen. What kind of oxygen? Well, not it's not water. Remember, we're, we're pretending it's not water. It's glucose. It's glucose. So we've got to pretend, imagine a little bit. What kind of oxygen? No way. What kind of oxygen? What did you say? Primary. Primary. Right. Um, you, you probably talked about these. Somebody yesterday said terminal. That's how you like to say it. Say it like that. If you understand terminal, say terminal. But you better know there's a difference between um, an alcohol. It's done to a carbon and it's done to another carbon versus an alcohol that's done to a carbon and a bunch of carbons, right? And we call those primary alcohols, secondary alcohols, tertiary alcohols. We probably spent a significant amount of time in organic chemistry talking about the differences in reactivity of these types of alcohols, right? Right? One of them can act as a much better nucleophile than another. Primary alcohols um, act as much better nucleophiles than secondary or tertiary alcohols. So glucose, our first step starts with a nucleophilic attack from a primary alcohol, right? So once we do this, how many more primary alcohols do we have left? Draw glucose in your mind. How many primary alcohols do you have left after you phosphorylate one of them? You have none left. You only have one to start with. You don't have any more left. So why do we need to change this to fructose? Once this is converted to fructose, guess what we have? Another primary alcohol. We have a new primary alcohol. That's what we can do with a new primary alcohol. Another phosphoryl transfer, right? We can initiate another phosphoryl transfer because we have another method of a nucleophilic attack. We're not going to draw this whole mechanism. I do want to explain if you have no idea what I've been talking about so far. You laugh. But maybe. Let me draw it and you'll see it. If you have no idea what we've talked about so far, we have glucose 6, or I'm sorry, fructose 6 phosphate, right? So fructose 6 phosphate. This is our new primary alcohol, right? We generated a new primary alcohol. What else? Fructose 6 phosphate. Is this an H or an OH? It's an anomeric carbon, right? This is your anomeric carbon. Carbon number two is your anomeric carbon, so this is an OH. This would be an H. If this was an OH, it would be an anomeric carbon. It's not. This is your anomeric carbon. 
had a question. Is that, that, so when you ask reducing sugar, or non-reducing sugar, identify uh, which of these is reducing sugar, Kate seems to miss it. The, only, the question is, where's your anomeric carbon? That's the real question. Where's your anomeric carbon and is that anomeric carbon, um, is it binding to something else? Is it, is it, is it, is it participating in a glycoside side bond? The answer is yes, non-reducing. The answer is no, open, reducing sugar, right? Um, do I have a free anomeric carbon? <coughs> so is this a reducing sugar? Yes, it's a monosaccharide. They're all reducing sugars, right? And if it was a disaccharide and this you had a glycosidic bond here, it would be a reducing sugar, right? So you have a free anomeric carbon. If it was a if this was participating in a glycosidic bond, this would be a non-reducing sugar, right? You would be using that anomeric carbon. No longer open. You're gonna see it on your next, not your next. You'll see it again in the final, I promise you. So if you missed that question, it's something you shouldn't do. Phosphate. This reaction. This is an enzyme catalyzed reaction. It's an en enzyme catalyzed reaction that is when is in the presence of magnesium. That magnesium is going to stabilize ATP, right? Um, so it's going to resist, stabilize ATP, it's going to help it resist uh, nucleophilic attack from the water, right? So that magnesium is going to stabilize this state, it's going to, it's going to not favor the transition state. That's what the enzyme is for, right? The enzymes. Help to overcome that barrier, structural barriers. <coughs> the magnesium, so remember it, it, it prevents or it doesn't, yeah. it inhibits, it, I guess that's good word. it inhibits uh, formation of the transition state, right? But it does do something favorable, it draws uh, its electron density away. Right? So here, this, this oxygen is kind of dumping some electron density off. Electron deficient phosphorus. Magnesium will pull some of that away, making this a better nucleophile. Nucleophilic attack from our primary alcohol. Fructose 6 phosphate. Nucleophilic attack. This is where it starts. Remember, we have our transition state. Um, the transition state changes geometries. This enzyme is called phospho. Fructose fructose, kick out ADP, kick out hydrogen, and we just get a product which is fructose, two phosphate groups. Our product is fructose. One six this phosphate. This phosphate. I don't like that. I wish it was five. I wish it was. It does not. Uh, if you have if, uh, three phosphates, you'll see some textbooks called three phosphates, tris phosphate. You'll see a lot of them that call them triphosphate. I don't like that. I don't like this. But unfortunately, they didn't ask me. This phosphate, um, this phosphate, that would mean two phosphates, right? Two phosphates. What's another term that means two phosphates? Two phosphate. Diphosphate, I guess you could say diphosphate. Um, I want you to know this phosphate is not the same thing as pyrophosphate. 
in your reading, you're using the phrase pyrophosphate. Pyrophosphate, you know pyrophosphate? No? It's one of the catchments. So well, you, you, that's when you saw it. Um, you've seen it um, from hydrolysis of ATP. What? Yeah, it's actually, um, so you, you see it in hydrolysis of ATP at the beta phosphate, not the gamma phosphate. So hydrolysis of ATP by water at the beta phosphate is not going to release inorganic phosphate, it's going to release inorganic pyrophosphate, so it'll be two phosphates that leaves. It, it'll, it'll release pyrophosphate, the two phosphates together, and um, A and P. This phosphate is not pyrophosphate. Why? Because you're using the same, same location, you're not connected to it. One's connected to carbon six, one's connected to one. This is your first major regular blood cell. Yes, step one is a regular blood cell. It is. It is compared to this step. It is a minor regular blood cell. Uh, at this step, um, glycolysis can officially shut down. Glycolysis uh, can be turned on. Also, for proteinase. It's kind of like I, I would if I was trying to put this in a, in a way that somebody that didn't know anything about life, it is an on-off switch. It is the master switch. If, if someone else turned the lights off, and this switch has the power to turn the lights back on. If somebody else turns the lights on, this 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 switch has the power to shut everything down. Um, it communicates with other pathways. It's it's a large player. Um, when we talk about the regulation. Of glycolysis, the entire pathway. Real quick. We're going to the main phase of PFK1. Why? Because it's a specific isolate. Fossil free proteinase that catalyzes this reaction. We're fixing to talk about another fossil free proteinase real quick. And that catalyzes something else. Uh, BFK1 is an allosteric regulatory enzyme. It shows these traits, sigmoidal kinetics. What is a sigmoidal, sigmoidal steady state curve? What is that indicative of? Shapes of cooperative. That's cooperative binding, right? So it's cooperative. Um, it should refer to that as the spectrum of as the ability to bind cooperatively. Um, it has allosteric activators. It has allosteric inhibitors. Allosteric activators, things like ADP, AMP, phosphate, fructose, two six is phosphate. Oh, it's the same thing. No, it's not the same. Equals two six bisphosphate. This is catalyzed by an enzyme. Phosphate feature kinase type two. It's an isocyte. Catalyzes production of fructose two six bisphosphate. Allosteric inhibitors. It's like ATP. Does that make sense? AMP, ADP, ATP. Does that make sense? It should, right? If you have a ton of ATP, does this need to happen? You don't need more, right? You don't need more. If you don't have much ATP, if this ATP has been um, consumed, that's, this is a sign that, hey, we don't have much ATP, right? We see a lot of ATP, we see a lot of energy. We don't have much ATP, we need more. Um, so these make sense, right? They should. They should make sense. The major one that we'll talk about uh, more in the next cycle. 
citrate. Uh, citrate is a, an intermediate, a product intermediate in the um, aerobic pathway in the PCA cycle. Uh, and you can imagine if the PCA cycle is turning out a bunch of citrate, it's turning out a bunch of ATP. We don't need it, right? We don't need it. So this is actually a way it can communicate with another pathway. So if that other pathway is working, that other pathway is working hard, uh, there is a lot of uh, specific intermediates. Um, this is a way for glycolysis to say, oh, whoa, 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 we're backed up. We've got enough energy. We can slow down. So this is actually a communication pathway with glycol uh, between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. This is unique. Activity of PFK2, so that would mean formation of F26. This control not hormones, insulin increases production of F26 bisphosphate. So, what kind of effect is that going to have on glucose or on phosphate glucose kinase? One. Increase production, increase production. It's going to activate, right? Um, so insulin activates this. It doesn't directly activate production of this. It activates phosphate two. It acts as an allosteric activator for phosphate. Uh, the product acts as an active allosteric activator for phosphate. Phosphate is one. Um, insulin is an, I guess, one for me activator. Glucagon. Once removed, deactivated. It's not really an inhibitor. Fructose 2 6 bisphosphate um, has two modes of allosteric regulation. Um, it does two different things. One, it increases binding affinity. Binding constant, binding constant in the first enzyme. It also reduces binding affinity. Yes, thank you. It also reduces binding affinity for ATP and C. It's not only an allosteric activator, it's actually um, an activator that can help overcome inhibitors. It doesn't help defeat inhibitors, right? It doesn't. It just changes the binding affinity for those inhibitors. Find the different sites. It doesn't help defeat them, it just changes the affinity for those. Increases affinity for those native sites. And it decreases affinity for allosteric binding of various inhibitors. So what you see in your textbook Use this phrase, it shifts the curve to the right and shifts the curve to the left. Did anybody use somebody, two people I think use that phrase when they go, I hate it. I hate it. Um, because it's something that you can easily memorize and it doesn't convey that you know what it really means. <coughs> the curve shifts to the right. Well, yes, if you looked at a graph and shifted to the right, you see that. What does that really mean um, in terms of activity, in terms of affinity?
So at the presence, in the presence of no inhibitor, no allosteric activator or inhibitor, uh, you see a sigmoidal binding curve. So we can assume it's so. So this is in the presence of no inhibitor, no activator, no allosteric binder, I guess you would say. That does kind of sound dumb, but we'll say it again. In the presence of an allosteric inhibitor, this curve, the textbook, all it says is it shifts to the right. What does that look like? This is what it looks like. Yes, it shifts to the right. So in the presence of something like ATP, this curve shifts to the right. What does that mean? It lower, lowers activity, right? It's lowering activity as it shifts to the right at a specific concentration. You go from an activity here to an activity down here. You go from an activity up here to an activity down here. You want to increase activity, right? It's going to decrease activity. In the presence of an activator, it's going to increase activity at the same concentration. In the presence of an activator, see something like this, like EP, allosteric activator. Same concentration. So if you pick one concentration, you can pick three activities. You can compare activities at this concentration. You can see in the presence of nothing, it has a reasonable activity. In the presence of an activator, it has an increased activity at the same concentration. In the presence of an inhibitor, it has some reduced activity. So if you are going to use a phrase, Shift the curve to the right and shift the curve to the left. One, you better draw a curve and explain it. Two, I just don't. I don't. And your textbook actually uses that and they talk about it for an entire paragraph in terms of the curve moving to the right and the curve moving to the left. Not a good way to teach them. I don't think. Oh my goodness. Almost out of time. We gotta go. There you go. Good finish. Uh, these next two steps. We've got six minutes. We're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Please read. Uh, fructose. Yes, thank you. Next step cleavage of fructose 1 6 is possible. Oh, we didn't talk about this. We probably should have. Um, uh, we did spend a lot of time on reaction number three. Why? It is a major area of glycolysis. It is, it, it is, I told you it is a major regulation step. Um, if you know anything about glycolysis, you should know a lot about step three, and you should know a lot of information about phosphate glucokinase. It is a major step in glycolysis. It is a thermodynamically unfavored step, right? Uh, it's a couple of days. Where did this come from? Uh, our phosphate transfer comes from. Right, so we have two steps coupled by ATP. This is our second step that was coupled by ATP. So it's an unfavorable step. Thermodynamic is unfavorable. How do we overcome that barrier? Couple by hydrolysis to phosphate. Okay. Cleavage of fructose 1 6 phosphate was cleaved by an enzyme called. Aldolase, uh, you may see this written in the textbook as fructose plus phosphate, aldolase. Uh, we we'll just call it aldolase. Okay, so I'm going to call it aldolase. Cleave by aldolase, we've talked about this reaction before. Yeah. Yeah. This reaction was two products. Uh, this reaction was two products. Uh, no, we're not doing that. That's fine. That's not how chemistry works. Cleavage of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate um, by aldolase leads to two products, a, a mixture of two products, DHAP, glyceraldehyde at 6, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And this was in our notes. 
that we talked about conversion um, from DHSD to glyceraldehyde, which is actually the next step, conversion. Uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphate is what's used. Uh, DHSD is not used in hydrolysis. Glycolysis, those are two different things. G3P is what is used in the subsequent steps of glycolysis. So reaction five converts DHAP. The remaining DHAP is formed from this reaction to G3P. Um, this has a equilibrium constant. And minus four molar. We're going to talk about if step 10 has an equilibrium constant of 10 to the fifth molar massive difference in equilibrium constant. This is a very small equilibrium constant. It has a delta G value of 0 0.23 molar. This is again small, very near zero, which tells you something about this reaction. Or tell you about this reaction. Small equilibrium constant, not really favorable, not really unfavorable. It's, it's pretty close to equilibrium. It's pretty. It's going to be slow, right? It's going to be slow, and it's going to be pretty close to equilibrium um, at any time. And it's pretty close. What's up? Negative 0 0.23 kilojoules per moment. Very small. Very close to zero. Very small equilibrium constant. It's, it's very bare. Um, why does this matter? Um, it's actually a nice kind of a, uh, we could say branch point. Probably not the best word, but we're almost out of time, so that's what we use. Branch point. Uh, gluconeogenesis. We talked about gluconeogenesis basically being the opposite of glycolysis, the formation of glucose uh, versus glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose. Uh, this is your and there are two types of enzymes involved in this reaction, class 1 and class 2. Class 1 enzymes are found in a high order of life, plants and big animals, animals. Class 1, and both of these go through an immediate class 1 goes through a ship phase. You don't know what a ship phase is from all the chemistry that's on the internet. Ship phase, you may wonder where in the world does the nitrogen come from? If you remember how ship phase is, it's a pure reduction of nitrogen. Where do we have a nitrogen? Enzyme has a nitrogen. So this forms a covalent enzyme substrate complex. If your question is where in the world does you get nitrogen from, you got that nitrogen from a lysine. That's the active site. Forms a covalent enzyme substrate complex. Class two types of enzymes occur in uh, eukaryotes and smaller prokaryotes. Um, this does not go through shift phase. It does not form a covalent enzyme substrate complex. However, it has a divalent metal cofactor at the active site. So, real quickly, what does this mean? Um, here, I'm not gonna, we're not going to draw a mechanism of these because both of these should be in your textbook. Mechanisms for both of these should be in your textbook. You should be able to identify which class of enzyme it is from the mechanism, which class it is. Uh, if, if you see a picture of the media, that's how it's stabilized, it should be very obvious, right? One of them contains metal, one of them does not contain metal. Uh, so what does this look like uh, in one, one situation? Intermediate form. Well, you talked about this, right? What are the roles of metal cations? The major roles of metal metal cofactor, um, metal cation cofactors in enzymes is to stabilize high valent or, or stabilize epoxy anions. And in class one enzymes, so I guess that's class three. In class one enzymes, it's not rising, it's rising.
you get your shift base here. And that's something you should look at this weekend if you don't remember what shift base chemistry is. Or what that shift base chemistry is. That's what's happening here. Uh, but the light seems to act as something. Exactly. Where we get cleavage, we get cleavage right here. If you can't find the mechanism for this, which you should be able to find it, it's in your textbook. If you want, if you don't, if you're like, oh, I want to practice, I want to practice mechanisms, I don't want to look at this, uh, but I need a help, I need some, I need help for a starting place. That would be a good idea. Um, before you look at this reaction mechanism, before you try to memorize this reaction mechanism, I, I wouldn't do it. Um, see if you could draw a reaction mechanism for this. If you know, learn, look what a shift base is. Uh, see if you could draw a reaction mechanism. But if you still need help with the reaction mechanism, you can think of alveolase cleavage is basically the reverse of an alveol, um, um, of an aldose cond condensation reaction from organic chemistry. Exact reverse of that. We will finish this chapter on Monday. I promise you, we will finish for sure. Um, from here on out, uh, you're going to see section five, um, reaction five. We're going to say refer to reaction two. I'll another tautomerization reaction. Where? Yes, that's glycerol high three phosphate. Did I say glucose three phosphate? Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.